Hello, everyone. Welcome to the DMV Business Show. I'm your host, Odo Sevilla. And today, our special guest is Ana Maria Aramillo. Ana Maria is the owner and founder of Voz Speech Therapy in La Tejana. So two different businesses. Can't wait to hear everything about it. Before we go into your story, Ana Maria, if you can sort of just briefly explain to the audience about the two businesses, what they are, who they are, and all about them. Yes, for sure. Thank you so much for having me. Um, two very, very different businesses. And thank you so much for saying boss so beautifully, because that has been uh, a little bit of a thing. It's always boss or booze or whatever, but it's boss, which means voice in Spanish. And um, I am a first generation Colombian bilingual pediatric speech language pathologist, which is like a whole mouthful, but in very few words. I help children um, achieve and increase their quality of life by helping them with their feeding skills, their swallowing skills, their communication skills. So I primarily work with children in the pediatric field, very, very tiny humans, ages like one to five. So that's the early intervention. And BOS is a pediatric speech therapy practice with myself and another bilingual provider. And um, we treat children with a whole array of neuro differences. So autism, apraxia, Down syndrome, articulation issues, stuttering. Most people know speech therapists as the individuals that help stuttering and children that maybe say wabbit instead of a rabbit, but it's actually way more medically complex than that. And I feel super honored to be able to help a child find their voice, which is why I named my practice Vos. So uh, that is one side of my life. I would say that takes up like 80% of my life. And then the other 20% is La Tejana. So I was actually born and raised in Texas. And my fiance is comes from a culinary background. He's now the chef of this business that we started last year during the pandemic. And our goal is to bring breakfast tacos and very specific breakfast tacos, Tex-Mex breakfast tacos to the DC area because this is the food that I grew up eating. He is from here. He's from Tacoma Park, Park Maryland. And I introduced him to his first breakfast taco ever last summer. And he was like, no, I'm not sorry, 2019. That's when we, I introduced him. And then last summer, he was like, I don't understand why DC doesn't have this incredible food. We should bring it. And I was like, no, that's too much work. You don't know how to make flour tortillas. But lo and behold, um, we started messing around in our kitchen in Mount Pleasant and we created this incredible flour tortilla and then we decided to actually fill it with all of these incredible things that I grew up eating, migas, bacon, egg and cheese, potato, egg and cheese, chorizo, arbacoa. And we have a pretty successful pop-up uh, business now in DC, going strong now a year and looking forward to hopefully getting a brick and mortar very soon. This is amazing. I can't wait to get into both of them. <laughs> <laughs> I know, very different, but I feel very happy every day that I get to do two things that I'm passionate about, helping kids and eating incredible food. Yes, that's great. You mentioned earlier Colombia. So were you born in Colombia? I wasn't. So my parents immigrated from Colombia when they were in their 20s. And my father is a physician. He's a cardiovascular anesthesiologist. And he actually did medical school in Mexico, in Monterrey. So I was born in Texas. And at two weeks, they shipped me to Mexico. And I lived in Mexico for the first five years of my life. And then I immigrated to the States and just continued to live in Texas. Um, until I moved here to DC. Well, what part of Texas? So I grew up on the border of Mexico in a little town called McAllen. Uh, it's in the RGV, shout out Rio Grande Valley. If you know, that's where the tacos are from. And then I went to school in Austin and I worked in Austin. So I feel like 
McAllen is my hometown, but Austin is like my adopted hometown where I really found myself, I think, as like my later years. Those two cities, well, pretty much the whole state of Texas, but McAllen and Austin just have gone through tremendous growth the past 10, 20 plus years. Yes, it is. I mean, Austin specifically, I went to St. Edwards and I started school in 2006. And then when I left in like 2013 to go get my master's in Boston, it was like night and day. I mean, sky rises, there's all these tech companies coming in. Even now, like people really hate on Austin and they're like, oh, it used to be weird. And now it's all like techie vibe. And I'm like, no, it's still weird. You just got to look for it. I, I love Austin. That's great. But you grew up in McAllen though, before you went to college in Austin, right? That's right. Yeah, I, I grew up, well, my dad did residency in Dallas, so I, I should say that I lived in Dallas for a little while, and then we settled in McAllen when I was like eight years old. So I lived in McAllen from eight to 17. Okay. So how were you growing up as a child? What were you into? <laughs> I was not as ambitious as I am today. I like really wasn't into school, and I was all about just like having friends and I was very social. I was always very into um, just not really being popular, but like I was just somebody that sought out friends and I was just very extroverted. And my dad was always like, this isn't a hotel. You can't just like come in and leave whenever you want. I was always finding an excuse to get out. And I was very into music and kind of didn't know like what I wanted to do with my life, but I was okay in that discomfort, which is so different than who I am now. I'm so type A, I'm rigid, I love school, I'm getting a doctorate. Like, I never thought I would get a doctorate ever. And I don't know what happened, but I, some, something in me was just like, all right, Anna, you gotta go for it. And so yeah, I don't, I was always very nice and very drawn to children. I was babysitting and nannying a lot of kids in my neighborhood. And I always knew I wanted to work with children in some capacity, but I didn't ever think that I would pursue the level of education um, and be so, and start a business or two businesses like ever. So <laughs> you mentioned your, your father was also a doctor. Do you think that had any influence in you as far as growing up? And obviously I know you totally two different career paths, but was, was there any effect there? You know, my father lived a very stressful life and he's still alive and he's still working. He's, he's very young. My parents uh, had us when they were very young and I was so turned off by the medical industry because I saw how hard his job was. Like he would come home and tell us like a patient died in the middle of surgery today and I'm processing that right now during dinner. And I would just be like, nope, I don't, that's not for me. I, I would, he would even smell like a hospital, his mm -hmm. scrubs. And I was just like, that's not, I don't want to be around that at all. So I think that subconsciously, I put it off for so long and then one day I just embraced it. I really was like a nerd at heart and I loved medicine and I loved where like the intersection of children with neurological disorders and like assessing the whole child and how that plays into like medicine. It, it, when I had that moment, I was like, oh, duh, like, my dad, like this is so my dad. So yes, I think that he did influence me to go in the medical route because my brothers are artists. They're both like, one's in film, one is a journalist, totally different than me. Um, but at the moment in my childhood, I was like, I'm gonna do the complete opposite of that. And now I'm like exactly like my dad. <laughs> when you had that moment, Ana Maria, you just mentioned now as far as children and piecing these things together, was this during high school, college, or when? So I was 100% convinced that I was going to be a child psychiatrist. I don't know why, like that was my thing. Pediatrician was a big no because I hate vomit. I hate when kids like throw up and I'm just like, no. 
So I knew that I had to go the like talking route and the mental route. So I was going to do medical school. So I studied child psychology and sociology. I double majored in that at St. Edwards in Austin. And then I got into a school to do clinical psychology because I wasn't sure about medical school because again, I was very social and I just wanted free time and I wanted to be able to party and do all the things I like to do. So I went to the first day of orientation in New York and I was like, I hate this. All I have to do is like test kids and diagnose kids and I don't even get to do a lot of therapy because that's typically what clinical psychologists do. So I called my dad and I was like, I don't want to do this. This is not what I signed up for. And he was like, you have one week to figure it out because then you're on your own. So we literally Google searched like careers that help children and, you know, teacher came out, social worker came out, pediatrician came out, and then speech language pathologist, occupational therapist, and physical therapist came out. And I just closed my eyes and I was like, mm, that one. <laughs> Literally, my dad was there right next to me. He was like, why that one? I was like, you know, I speak Spanish. That's my first language. And I speak English. And I'm probably going to learn how to speak Italian because I was going to go live in Italy for a little bit. And so I was like, maybe I can just reach more kids because I speak another language. Mind you, I had no idea what a speech pathologist did. I had never met one. I had never met a kid that had any problems with communication. I never met a kid with autism. And so I found a school in Texas, in San Antonio, and I drove two hours and I banged on the dean's door. And I was like, you need to let me into your program. And she was like, no, admissions closed like three months ago. And we're at capacity. We only accept 25 students. This is a very competitive field. You're going to have to apply next year. I was like, no, you don't understand. My dad is going to kill me. Like, a master's is a minimum for me. I have to get this master's degree. She was like, you know what? Give me your resume. The only way that I'm going to let you in the program is if you promise to be my research assistant. And I was like, okay, done. I'll work for free. I'll do whatever you want me to do. So she let me in the program. And then after that, the rest was history. I fell in love with the field. And now I'm on my way to becoming a doctor. So that's great. I love that. It, it, you know, it, it's so different. You, you mentioned just now the comment that you, you have to at least have a master's, bare minimum. But you told me also you have two other siblings, two brothers, I believe, and they're both artistic, um, which is totally different. I, I guess they didn't feel that influence with dad growing up in the same household that you did. You know what? I'm not going to bash my brothers because I love them and they are way smarter than me but I am definitely more disciplined than my brothers. So they're like IQ wise, they probably have a higher IQ than me and they're just brilliant, but they're a little bit, uh, I wouldn't say lazy, but they're not as determined and like, just like type A, like I am. When I want something, I get it no matter what, blood, sweat, tears and they are just a little bit more chill and type B. So I think the artists, like when my dad realized that they weren't gonna be doctors, <laughs> he kind of was like, you know what, it's time to embrace it. And he bought my brother all the best camera equipment, made sure he went to film school. My older brother is still in school right now doing some other stuff. Um, and so I think, once he saw the fire in me and he knew that like I was going to be his legacy, then he kind of just, it was a non-negotiable. Like I had to continue to excel. So we're just different. I love them, but we're very different. You know, it's so true though. You know, you can be in the same household, but everyone has their own personality and having children my own, I can clearly see all of them are very different. And even with my younger brother, it's, it's only me and my brother I'm more of sort of the disciplined one. He was more, uh, not artistic, because he's not, in, and he's not in art at all. He, he's in like IT and tech. But he was more sort of the relax, he's chill. And, and I have that, but I, I'm less of that. I'm more just rigid. And it's like, okay, boom, 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 boom. 
And yeah. same household is just different personality. Yeah. 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 <laughs> my, my mom is, my mom is extremely chill and she is carefree. She's always happy. She's never stressed. And my dad is very different. So I think I know what happened with the gene, gene pool there. <laughs> so you, you get into the school in San Antonio, but then you said also you end up going to Boston, right? Yes, because I graduated with psychology and sociology, and that does not allow me to pursue a graduate degree in communication science and systems disorders, because that's what you need to be a speech language pathologist. So I had to take a full year of prerequisites to be able to then apply to grad school. So that was the year in San Antonio, it's called a leveling year. And there's only like three or four schools in all of Texas that offer that one year for students to then be able to apply. So I finished in San Antonio and then I wanted to get the heck out of Texas. I was like, get me out of here. This is so backwards. I love you guys, but like, I need to see the world. So I applied to the farthest school possible, and my dad obviously was not super happy with that, but it was either Miami, California, New York, or Boston. And I ended up getting into quite a few schools, but I chose um, Emerson College's program because it was ranked like number 10 um, for my program, and it has a really strong clinical component, and I didn't want to do research. So I ended up choosing uh, Emerson and studied there, and, and finished them. Literally the day I graduated, I flew back to Texas because it was too cold. I couldn't do it. Oh, so you weren't a fan <laughs> of Boston that much. I was then. not, I was, I did not like Boston at all. It was too cold. There were too many universities. I felt that it was very clicky. Like, where do you go to school? Oh, you go to Harvard? Oh, you go to Boston College? It was very like that. And that's not how I was raised at all. So I was like, I'm going to go back home. So I went to Austin. Okay, so you go back, you go back to Austin and then what happens? And then I work, it's, it's like my first big girl job, right? I have my masters and I'm working for this huge home health agency. So I'm doing um, therapy visits in home and I'm working with only Spanish speaking children, primarily on Medicaid. Um, so there was a lot going on in these homes other than speech and language issues or feeding issues. So I became very involved with these families on the advocacy level. So not just helping them with their communication skills, but also increasing health literacy for them and kind of navigating the healthcare system with them because it was very confusing in this country and also having a language barrier makes it even more difficult. So I kind of like poured my heart and soul into um, these home visits that I was doing and I got really, really burnt out. Uh, I was just doing a lot and I was supervising like three speech language pathology assistants. So those are individuals that have uh, finished their bachelor's in communication science and disorders, but have not yet pursued their masters. Um, and so I did that for about five years. And then I met Augustus, Gus, my fiance at a wedding in Philly. And I was like, I'm not going to do long distance. Like I love my life in Austin. I was having the best time. It was like being in college again. And then I fell in love and I was like, okay, somebody's got to move. And he was like, I'm not moving to Texas. <laughs> He's like, Texas is crazy. And I'm like, you're right. It is a little bit whack. Although Austin is great, but the rest of Texas is like, yeah. So I decided to move to DC in 2018. And that's when I opened Vols um, because I just couldn't find a job that like fit the mold of what I wanted to do. So I was like, let me just start my own thing. So that's kind of how it happened. Now, that was a big step going from working for someone in Austin to basically opening up your own shop, let's call it, in D.C. here, especially you just moved. This is a new city, new town for you. How, how was that experience or how did you go about navigating through that whole process? Yeah, that is a really great question. Um, somewhere in that month of when I moved here and like the dead 
like cold of January. I mean, it was, there was snow everywhere. I was like, what did I do? What did I get myself? Like I was having Boston flashbacks, you know, I, was like, I can't <laughs> do this again. Snow apocalypse and Nemo and all these blizzards. And, and then I think I just realized like my worth, like only 7.2% of speech language pathologists are bilingual, which is wild if you think about it. And only 6.2% are Latina or Latinx. So I'm like, I'm literally sitting on a gold mine right now. And I'm gonna go give my heart and soul to a company that's going to exploit me, which is what they've been doing the past seven years. Just, oh, you're bilingual? I'm not even gonna look at your resume because we need you so bad to treat this whole population of kids. I mean, it's something like 44% of families in the DMV speak another language other than English. I mean, the DC area is one of the most diverse areas in the country. And that's kind of when like my business light bulb went off and I was like, supply demand, right? Like I have something, a product, a service that so many people need. I'm not going to give my worth or my time to anybody that doesn't pay me or compensate me correctly because I always had a middleman, right? It was always Ana Maria giving therapy and then the middleman would find a school or another agency and they would get the money. And so I cut all that out and I became an independent contractor first, not an employee for a company. And then one day, oh my gosh, I'll never forget this moment. I was at a school doing an evaluation and the special ed coordinator pulled me to her office and she's like, you know, you're different than all of the other pathologists that we've worked with before. And I was like, really, what do you mean? She's like, you're just like really passionate and you're really good with kids and you just play with them and interact with them so differently. And she's like, I have a question for you and don't take this the wrong way, but like, she's like, how much, how much do they pay you per evaluation? And I was like, the company I'm contracting with? She's like, yeah. I'm like, they pay me two fifty, dollars And she's like, oh, that's interesting. I was like, why? She's like, do you know how much we pay them? I was like, no, can you tell me? She's like, yeah, $1,000. I was like, what? And that day, literally that day, I called an accountant that I had found through the grapevine. And I was like, you need to open an LLC for me right now. And she was like, what do you mean? I was like, I need to start a business. I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. And the rest is history. <laughs> wow. Now, starting your own business, you're, you're now wearing several hats. You have many roles. And I'm sure one of them, one of the most ones is sort of focusing on the top line and bringing revenue in. How do you go about establishing then bringing that clientele? So Vos started in 2018 as a home health company because that's what I knew. That's what I was good at and that's what I had mastered in Austin. So I was going to houses all over the DC area and I was treating patients in home. I just opened with Arun's help um, my clinic, which is downtown DC. And now I have an actual office where patients come to me. So it's a big change for families, especially because I'm offering them convenience. I'm offering them a service that is professional, I'm highly qualified, and I'm coming to them. So they literally don't have to do anything. So um, yes, the biggest shift and the hardest part of being a business owner right now and the role that I have right now since I just opened in May has been finding referral sources and having these patients come to me. So I'm in the process of credentialing or getting credentialed with several insurance companies, which is something I've never done before because I was private pay only, which means parents would pay me out of pocket and then they would submit a bill to their insurance company and insurances would reimburse them. So Vos didn't have to deal at all with the insurance companies. Now it's the complete opposite because I'm looking for volume. So I'm trying to get as many patients as I can through the door. 
And I'm trying to tap into the Latinx bilingual community. And most of them are uh, use Medicaid or have some type of private insurance. So I'm in the process of doing that. And I'm hopeful that once I get approved, that these insurance companies will allow me to just bring in more patients. Because right now it's a lot of private pay families find me on Google, it's word of mouth, somebody's worked with me before, there's a school that you know knows about my services. Um, I, I try to do expo events. I mean, I really try to put myself out there, but Instagram, I have a big Instagram following. And so I think that, um, Hopefully, like the patients will start coming more frequently once I have when I, when I increase access to therapy, which is through accepting insurance. Because that's a that's a big deal, and not a lot of speech therapy practices accept insurance, which is really sad for children that, that absolutely need it. Well, I I didn't know that you didn't accept it. So when you were going to these visits at people's homes, this was just all you establishing and building the business through word of mouth or just other sources and other avenues then yeah i built my website completely by myself i built my instagram following by myself I, I would just put flyers all over my neighborhood and the next day they would all be taken down i like would cold call schools i would walk into like pediatricians offices and just wear my scrubs with my credentials and give them a flyer i mean i'm fearless in that sense like I don't care if people say no because the worst thing they can say is we're not interested but what if I made an impact on one family and then that one family and especially in DC like you never know who you're talking to so I always present myself very professional and I treat everybody the same because it could be a mom that's on the board of I don't know some nonprofit. And then all it takes is for her to drop your name in one email and you have all these phone calls. So I've always been kind of, I don't know, ruthless <laughs> with marketing, but um, it, I survived. My company, you know, survived the last, it survived the pandemic, which is crazy because speech therapy, I mean, on a screen is, as you can imagine, with a two-year-old, very hard. But yeah, we got, gosh. We got through it. <laughs> I, I'm curious with all the different marketing tactics, tactics that you've used thus far, is there any one or two specifically that you've seen more growth coming from? You know, word of mouth, um, moms and dads and parents love to talk. And if they have a great experience with a medical provider, they're going to tell the cousin, the friend, the school, the teacher, they're going to tell everybody because I think that sadly, there are fewer um, really great medical professionals than there are, you know, really like mediocre medical professionals or professionals that may just see you as a number. Like, all right, let's get it in and out. Um, and my therapy model is very personalized, very individualized. I involve the family, I involve the, everybody, the, every stakeholder in that child's life. Um, gets to hear from me and I'm very like actively engaged with all of the everything the child does so I think that word of mouth has been huge but also my website um I started doing some blogs and I got a little bit of traction my Instagram account has helped me I've never gotten a like a patient off Instagram but I've had moms share my Instagram and then they go to my website and then they'll read about me and then they'll maybe like call. So yeah. They, they, they all help each other out. Yeah. 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 So where did La Tejana come in, in involved in all this? Because I know you said it was sort of born during the pandemic, right? Yes, definitely a pandemic baby <laughs> through and through because Gus, my fiance, um, who has been in the culinary scene in the industry here for many years, was working um, at Ellie, which is a very well-known restaurant here in Mount Pleasant, and we lived just around the corner. So he was serving at Ellie, um, and then the pandemic happened, and he got laid off. 
and he didn't have anything really going on but we like he always had this dream that he was going to bring these incredible breakfast tacos that he tried both in Austin and McAllen to DC and so one day he just went out and started calling like all these people in McAllen and Austin and talking to them about tortillas. He started doing research on different lards. He started doing um, research like on YouTube and just like figuring out anything in every way that you can make a flour tortilla. And it took like three to four months to perfect the tortilla. But the real breaking point in the business when we decided like, okay, we have something here was we had one pop-up scheduled right before the pandemic. I'm talking December, 2019. So the pandemic happened March, 2020. And we got written up. Um, it was like, we didn't even have a name then, I think. It was just like DC breakfast tacos popping up at room 11. Um, and they shouted me out and said that I was a McAllen native. And so we got a little bit of buzz. People showed up. We sold like 450 tacos. We had no idea what we were doing. It was a complete chaos. Um, Is it just and you and him then? It was, he hired like, well, his friends came and helped him cook. Okay. Like okay. it was like <laughs> not, or it was so, so bad. Like people waited for their tacos for like 45 minutes for like three tacos, right? It's like, it was a disaster. And before that, in October, 2019, we had a stoop uh, sale. Like we illegally set up on our stoop in Mount Pleasant and I wrote on a chalkboard, a hundred breakfast tacos, 10 a.m. to sell out. And we knew that everybody from the farmer's market was gonna be passing our street. So everybody that came from the market, I'd be like, hey you, have you ever had a breakfast taco? And they're like, me? I'm like, yeah, come here, come here, come here. Try one, try one. It's only $3. And so I would hook all these people in and then they were waiting for their tacos forever. Also a disaster, complete disaster. But we sold out, we sold a hundred tacos. So then we did the pop-up in December. We sold 450 tacos. And then we had all these pop-ups lined up, ready to go. And then the pandemic happened. So that's when Gus was like, I'm going to dedicate my time to just perfecting this flour tortilla. So he made some tortillas. He put a picture on Instagram. And one of our friends was like, hey, dude, everyone's out here making bread. You're making tortillas. Like, can you just make me a dozen? Like, I would really love to just have them at my house because nobody was leaving their house. So Gus was like, sure, yeah, I can make you a dozen tortillas, no problem. So he goes, drops them off. Well, this guy's kind of a big deal here. He's an, he's an artist, he's a muralist, he's very well connected. He uploads the pictures of the tortillas on Instagram and everyone starts asking him, dude, where'd you get those tortillas? Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. And he was just like, Gus, man, you gotta sell them. So Gus starts putting them on Instagram. Hey, we're selling tortillas. We were making every week between five and 600 tortillas and delivering them for free. So we were actually losing money because we had no idea what we were doing again. 500 to 600 tortillas a weekend, delivery Saturday to Sunday, all over DC. That happened May, 2020, up until we got our first residency at Thami which was a restaurant on H Street. Um, and that was our first pop-up that we like had an actual recurring weekly thing and we stopped tortilla deliveries. But the tortilla delivery thing got out of control. Like we never fulfilled the orders. In 10 minutes, they would sell out every time. People were just sending us emails and DMs and please, like, can you make them during the week? And we're like, no, it's literally just us two. We cannot physically make any more tortillas. And then now we are just doing great with this pop-up stuff. And now the pop-up, is it just in one location or does it vary? So we are, um, we have a residency every Saturday at Nido, which is in Mount Pleasant. So we're, we're back in our, in our stomping grounds. 
and we're there from 9 a.m. until we sell out. We typically sell out like between like two, two and a half hours later. And then we're in Grand Duchess at Adams Morgan on Sundays at 11. And then we do like one-off pop-ups. So people will reach out to us and be like, hey, do you want to cater this event? Or um, like this brewery likes us to do nachos. So we do nachos. So residency wise weekly saturday sunday is always a thing um but then we'll take you know random gigs like when people ask us to i, I love the name how, how, how whose idea was la Tejana? it took so long to figure that name out oh my gosh we didn't have a name for so long it really started with paying homage to like Tex-Mex food, right? Because Tex-Mex food has a really bad rep. Like people talk really bad about it. Oh, chips and salsa, queso, guac, it's so cheap. Like nobody ever wants to pay money for this craft product, but it's actually, it's incredible. It's an incredible, it's so culinarily rich. Like it has so much, um, to offer like fajitas. That's all Tex-Mex. So we knew that the name had to be symbolic of my roots, but we didn't necessarily know if it had to be like me. So we went back and forth and then it really came together um, when we started designing our logo. So our logo is, it's a woman with long brown hair and she's wearing a flower crown. She doesn't have a face. And so the logo is me, but the reason that logo came about is because in San Antonio, there's a very famous festival called Fiesta, and it happens every year. And all the women wear flower crowns, and everyone dances and, and eats Tex Mex food, and Selena is like a big part of it. And so I was like, how can, how would we best like pay tribute to all these women at Fiesta and all the women that I grew up around? And then Gus was the one that was like, you are La Tejana. Like, that's the logo, that's you. Like, these are your roots. And that was it. And after that, like, we asked our friends and they were like, oh my gosh, it's perfect. Because, you know, people that don't speak Spanish can still say it. Although we do get like, hello, late Jana. And we're like, <laughs> come on. Like, it's really not that hard. And then we explain it and they're like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. But yeah, I, I love the name, I do. I know, it is a great name. I'm curious for this speech therapy practice, is it mostly children that speak Spanish and English or it, it varies? So obviously because my first language is Spanish, I specialize in treating and working with children that speak Spanish, but my clinical training is really in multilingual, multicultural children. So I see kids from all different ethnicities and races and backgrounds. So I am trained to provide um, a clinical evaluation and differentiate between a language disorder and a language difference. So really I can treat um, any kid. Okay, that's great. What would you say now, Ana Maria, that drives and motivates you? You know, every day it changes because some days I have these interactions with families where it's just so powerful to give a child a voice. Like when a child says, I love you, mom, for the first time, or a child signs more for the first time, or a child uses a device to ask for a hug. For the first time like that stuff is so powerful to see happen in real life or maybe introduce um, a new food for a child that wasn't eating properly before like the families that i work with motivate me the most they are so strong they are so resilient they come they show up to therapy and they just put in the work and i think that is the biggest piece of my speech language pathology hat. For La Tejana, what motivates me every day is 
giving of food that provides nostalgia and comfort to so many what I call text packs here in DC. Like when I had someone bite into the taco and look me dead in the eyes and say, I haven't been able to go home since the pandemic. This tastes exactly like what my abuelita used to make me. Woo! I'm like, I'm done. I'm dead. Like that's all I needed to hear. And so having those interactions with the customers that wear their Texas gear and they're so excited to eat these tacos. It's just so cool. And I'm so happy to be a part of it. I love that. You know, what's interesting is in, obviously your parents are Colombian and having grown up, having grown up in Texas, and I know you also lived in Mexico for, for a while. And there's such a huge influence in Texas for Mexican, because Mexico is right there is the border. You know, growing up, is the household mostly Colombian food or was it a combination also of Mexican or Tex-Mex? I love that question so much because <laughs> my dad is like the most Colombian dude you'll ever meet. He's like, you can't speak with a Mexican accent. You have to speak with a Colombian accent. We have to eat this type of rice. And he was so like gung-ho about preserving Colombian culture because all of my friends were Mexican. So that would obviously rub off on me, right? Like sure. there were times where I was like eating, like <laughs> drinking micheladas and raspas with chamoy and all of this like stuff that my dad never grew up eating. And so I think it was this constant ba internal battle within myself to make sure that I stayed like true to my Colombian roots because we would go to Colombia very frequently during the year, like three, four times a year. So I have family there and I have a house there and everything. But um, growing up, my house was 100% Colombian, but everything outside of my house was Mexico. Like, I don't even consider myself being raised in the United States because like the border crossed it, right? It wasn't the other way around. Like McAllen is, at, was at one point Mexico. So I was speaking Spanish at school. I was speaking Spanish at the movie theater. I was speaking Spanish at restaurants. I mean, it's like 98% Mexican American. So I'm very influenced by American culture, Mexican culture and Colombian culture. And it's nice that even now with your profession, you are probably still speaking probably over 90%, I would, I would assume, right? Spanish most of the yeah. time. Yeah, I would say right now my patient caseload is about 70% Spanish speaking kids and then 30% English speaking kids. So some days I get home and I, I'm like, what's that word in English? Like yesterday I, I, I said to me, I'm like, put the top on, but I meant to say tapa. But I like in my head, I was like, oh, sorry. I was like, tapa, top, uh, whatever, lid, lid. That's what I meant to say. So it happens a lot. But I'm, I'm so grateful because Spanish is such an important part of my life. Like Gus speaks fluent Spanish. He is American, comes from an American family. No one in his family speaks Spanish. And he is fluent. He only speaks Spanish in the kitchen with, with the cooks. And he speaks Spanish to the customers. And you know, God willing, when we have a child, uh, he will not hear any English for the first five years of his life. <laughs> That's great. So did he know Spanish prior to meeting you or did he have to learn it? Because he learned Spanish through this very cool language immersion school in Middlebury, which is in Vermont. So he literally went out to the woods for seven weeks and had to sign a language pledge where he promised to not speak a word of English for seven weeks. And he went in there speaking, eh, you know, basic conversational hola, como estás, to like fluent. And then when he met me, I, we try to speak Spanish at home and with my dad, like my dad refuses to speak English to anybody. He just does not. He's like, Oh, you speak five words in Spanish. Okay. I'm gonna talk to you in Spanish the rest of the conversation. And that's just how it is. So I think Gus has really got to um, practice the Spanish. And that's a great school. This is in what, during college, the Vermont school you just mentioned? or Yeah, he went the summer of his junior year. So he was like 20 or 21 years old. And he's like, listen, like if I, I'm going to be in this industry, I need to know Spanish because immigrants literally like 
make up the industry. They uphold this, the, the food industry and many other industries, but primarily many of the cooks in DC are um, Spanish speaking. So he did it and he came out like speaking beautifully. And he, you know, and of course he's like, I don't speak that good. I'm like, yes you do, so <laughs> great. You mentioned earlier how there are so very few, I think there's single digits as far as bilingual speech therapists. And I'm sure that's helped your business tremendously, right? Yeah, you know, it has opened so many doors, um, not just for the patients that I treat, because of course, if you have a Spanish speaking family and the child has only been exposed to Spanish from ages birth to three, parents are going to be looking for a Spanish speaking pathologist to treat their child. That makes complete sense. But being a bilingual speech language pathologist has also opened up doors for me, like in my field to be an adjunct professor. So I'm a professor at NYU and I teach for the bilingual extension program, which is amazing. And then I'm also, I do a lot of mentoring for like black and brown SLPs that have never really seen another person look like them, talk like them, come from a background like them. And that is so powerful. Um, I started an organization called Diversity SLP, where we literally try to recruit high schoolers that are black and brown to become speech language pathologists so we can move this number in the right way because the patients that we treat don't match up with the demographic profile of speech language pathologists. And it's really a problem. Like it is a huge issue that my field hasn't really figured out how to like tackle and fix. So by recruiting these high schoolers into the field, we hope that we can increase diversity, but also um, talk about being an anti-racist in the field. Because when you have a field that's predominantly white, there's a lot of misconceptions and there's a lot of room for error. And so it's just opened so many doors for advocacy for my field. And I, I feel very strongly about the work that I do besides being a clinician. So I love how you're giving back and doing all this too, as far as opening doors to others who, are, who may be similar to you in the field. Yeah, it's, that is like, I, I spoke at my alma mater, Emerson's orientation, Two weeks ago, they had me stream. I had like a huge head. I was just like a huge screen and all the students were sitting, you know, they're in person now. And I was going on and on about the advocacy work that I do and how we need to move these numbers. I was on my soapbox, you know, I was getting mad. I always get really mad and fired up and try to get them fired up because they should care about this stuff and nobody talks about it in grad school. And then I got a message on my Instagram and it was like, hey, I'm a first generation Colombian student. I just got into the program. I can't believe I saw someone that looks like me. And I was like, <laughs> that's it. That's like the best feeling. It's so validating. That, that's, uh, that's so nice. I, I agree. There's a lot of industries there that you don't see a lot of people who may look like you or me. And why not just be an advocate and, and help? And it just reminds me, I'm in commercial real estate, totally different industry, but in my industry, over 75% are typically older white men. They do not look like me. And just like you, you sort of have to look to that advantage. And a lot of the business owners that I personally work with are either immigrants or first, second generation immigrants or minorities. It's interesting. I was just having a meeting with another business owner the other day and she was like, she's Nigerian. And she's like, you're so different. And I wasn't sure in what she meant. I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, you just treat me. You talk to me very different. The other people that I'm talking with, they sort of just, she, she didn't say it in detail, but the day, and I was like, well, I treat everyone the same equal. And she was like, it, it, it's, it's just very different, I guess, even just with any type of minority or immigrant that you may be dealing with. Absolutely. That is like, probably the, the best thing or feedback you can hear from a client, right? It's like, you took the time to listen because nobody really listens anymore these days. Listening is, active listening is very hard to find. And the fact that you treat everybody the same as you should 
probably left such an imprint on her and she's probably going to want to use your services or connect with you more just because you made that difference in her life. So a lot of things that go unseen, but I see them because I've seen my dad struggle. I've seen my mom struggle. I've struggled not fitting in, feeling weird, feeling like the different one in my, in my group. Um, and I just don't think that that's fair for, for other students to feel that way. So giving back has been, it's been really fulfilling. And Maria, having these two businesses, what advice would you give to someone who came to you, just any type of business, whether in the food or any, any type of business starting out, they wanted to start their own business, what would you say you need to do one, two, or three? I would say, ask yourself why. So finding your why, finding your purpose, finding your mission, um, and keep asking yourself why is like gonna be the driving factor for, for the success of your businesses. Because if you're doing it for the wrong reasons, you're gonna be burnt out, you're gonna give up, and you're not gonna be able to put your all because owning a business is so much more work than it looks. It looks glamorous and it's cool to say, oh yeah, I'm the owner. But like in the background, you're over here putting out fires 24 hours a day, you know, and you're trying to like keep it together. So I would say definitely find your purpose first. Um, the second thing would be find your audience, you know, who are you marketing to and figure out what works the best for that audience. Like the first thing that I did after I called my accountant and had her open my LLC was really figure out my website because I wanted my website to be inviting. I wanted it to be professional, but also very warm and, and like paint a, a good picture of who I am and the services that I offer. And then just like put yourself out there, be fearless. Just like if you think somebody needs to know about your product or your service, like it's never gonna come to you. You have to go knock on people's doors. You have to want it. You have to get out of your comfort zone and just don't be afraid to, to get rejected. You're gonna get rejected so many, I've been rejected so many times and I still continue to get rejected every day. And I'm still out here because I know my purpose and I know my passion and I know my why. If I didn't have that to fall back on, I probably would have just quit and become an employee with a salary, with benefits. But I chose the hard route because it's going to be all worth it one day. And it has been so far. I love it. And like you said, it's true. It is hard. Sometimes you may question and be like, gosh, I could just be a W-2 collecting that paycheck every two weeks or weekly, whatever it is, and not have to worry about all these other things. Um, totally. but what is your why? And it has to be greater than, than that. Yes, it does. And like, I tell people all speech language pathologists on Instagram, DM me all the time. How did you start your practice? How did you know how to do it? And I'm like, I'm not going to tell you step by step what I did. Like that, that's my struggle. I had to figure it out on my own. I can help you. I can mentor you if you have specific questions. But like, I'm not going to baby you guys and give you a guidebook because you literally learn from your struggles and your mistakes along the way. And if it were easy, every speech language pathologist would have a private practice. And I like barely any do because we don't learn these things in, in school, which is why Arun, you know, has a great business now because he's literally helping professionals figure it out. But Yes, the idea of being an employee crosses my mind once a week when I'm like, man, it would be so nice to get the same amount of money deposited in my account every two weeks, even if I didn't work that day. Like having a salary, oh my gosh, I haven't had a salary in four years. And I just keep telling myself like, nothing worthwhile is easy. And my mom tells me that every time I call her, she's like, it'll be worth it. Just keep pushing. It. So I'm not giving up anytime soon. That's, a, that's good. Don't. I won't. Are there any specific habits or traits 
that you feel Ana Maria have helped you, whether personally or in business? Yeah. Um, I really think that my background as a speech language pathologist, as a communication expert has really helped me be in tune with other people and understand other people and listen and be mindful. Um, I think I have very good people skills, like interpersonal skills. I know how to have a conversation. I can literally talk to a wall, like, or anybody from any background. Um, organization, time management, discipline, having a schedule, and not just having a schedule, but really like making time for self-care and putting that in your schedule. So maybe in your schedule you have working out and then you have meetings and then you have patients and then you have to read or you have to write a paper for school. But somewhere in that schedule, you have to take time to really do something that you love and that is not gonna like take brain power, whether that's watching an episode of your favorite show or taking a bubble bath or running. Um, I learned that the hard way after several, you know, nervous breakdowns along the years where I'm just like, I can't do it anymore. And it's like, because I wasn't saying yes to me, I was saying yes to everybody else. And so I think having boundaries and knowing when to say no, um, and just showing up for your business every day, you're going to have really bad days and, and days where, you know, you're not going to feel like this was worth it, but then you're going to have really great days. So just being resilient and um, trying to take advice from others that have done it before and learn from them. Um, really just being like open to like good days and bad days, I think is it's been what has helped me so not just like one skill but kind of a mix of all those okay what would you say is your biggest challenge with your role at both speech therapy and la tejana today so at both it's being a treating clinician to the lead clinician and also running the business those are two completely different roles that i have to take on 24 seven, my work never stops. I, I don't just stop working on the weekends. There's always something I have to do for my business, whether that's file a tax form, whether that's pay an invoice, whether that's pay a provider, whether that's write an evaluation report. So really um, having enough hours in the day has been the struggle for me as a lead clinician and as a owner. And then for La Tejana, it's like, I have so many ideas of where I want La Tejana to go. But again, like I have so many other things going on and I have to make sure that Bos excels and I get Bos to where I need it to be. Cause right now it's not where I want it to be cause I just opened. So I'm still in those like early preliminary stages of credentialing and getting patients through the door. Um, so I think the biggest challenge is really like taking it one step at a time and not trying to do too much all at once. Cause I have really big, crazy goals. And sometimes I'm just like one day at a time. It's hard. You have to have them though. That's great. <laughs> so like my professor calls them big, hairy, audacious goals. Have you heard that word? Before? Yes, I have. <laughs> she always talks about that. I'm like, oh, I have too many of those. What do you know now that you wish you would have known at the start of your career? Um, I wish somebody would have told me that it was going to be hard <laughs> and that I was going to get rejected so many times and that uh, going to graduate school to get a doctorate, being a professor and opening a clinic is a terrible idea. I wish somebody would have told me that. Um, and I wish somebody would have told me that even in the hardest, hardest moments, like you should always be grateful for 
the things that you do have in that moment and that those hard moments are teaching you a lesson that there's always room for a teachable moment um because i'm very dramatic i'm a leo so i like every like the world is ending every day if something goes wrong and i wish that somebody would have told me like it's okay like it's okay to feel that way because you always have tomorrow to start a new day and i'm trying to tell myself that today but i think that in tv and in media being a woman entrepreneur latina entrepreneur is so glamorous and they make it seem so easy like oh she gets to wear like beautiful heels and makeup and clothes and everyone listens to her and she's just like a boss but they don't like see they don't see the struggle like and that's how i'm very real about talking about the mental health struggle the like what you don't see on screen right and nobody really told me that before and i want everyone to know that now like if you take on this decision like you're going to have really crappy days but most of your days are going to be really good and you just got to find that purpose I love that. that this leads me to one of my last few questions here. When you're not busy with both businesses, what do you like to do for fun to unplug? Great question. I'm trying to develop more hobbies, but I really really love to be outside. So, I played soccer my whole life. I was a crazy crazy like love soccer and I started playing when I was 3. and i got a scholarship to play in college but i turned it down again cuz i wanted to have a social life and i was like i'm done with soccer so being outside was part of my life forever so i like to do yoga and run and go on hikes i love the beach so i try to go to the beach as much as i can um i also really like taking like bubble baths that's been a very like new pandemic hobby that i developed i bought this like fancy bamboo tray and i fill the tray up with like with everything i can find for no reason just to feel like i'm in a hotel and i have all these things on my tray um i'm not super into reading as much as i would like like reading for fun cuz i read for school a lot read a lot of research for school so i have let that hobby down a little bit but um music has been i think like one of my biggest escapes so i like to dance and i'm always listening to like reggaeton and salsa and um yeah i just kind of like being outside i think in nature is my biggest my biggest hobby that's great what does the future look like for you and boss in latihana so latihana is hopefully going to be moving into a brick and mortar um by the end of the year if not the end of the year in the spring because the pop up life is growing as you can imagine um we have a ghost kitchen so gus and his team make everything off site and then have to transport 500 tacos across the city in like cambros and sell them piping hot to the customers making sure quality is up there. He wakes up at 3 a.m. and does all of this three times a week and he's just tired and I wow. see it and I'm like this life is not sustainable. So the future of La Tejana is brick and mortar for sure and then um launching like a merch line. So we're both really into fashion and so we're going to have shirts and hats and jars and stuff like that. So that's going to be fun. It's going to be a good creative outlet for both of us. And then for Boss, I have a lot of plans for Boss, but I'll keep it short. It's obviously making this clinic just pop and fill it with so many children that need our services and then bring in occupational therapy and physical therapy in the clinic. And then as part of my doctorate, my my dissertation, um, I'm going to be opening a nonprofit organization for Latinx families to increase health literacy. So all the stuff that I was doing in Austin by helping them navigate a diagnosis and navigate special education and understanding what autism is and like apraxia and all these disorders that 
doctors don't really have the time to explain to their patients in the moment. Um, I'm going to create these hands-on educational courses for these families that are free for them to be able to increase their health literacy. So I'm hoping to get to that goal once I graduate um, in March. So I defend in March and I'm hoping to start that sometime next year. Well, it's a very busy the next couple of years for you. Yeah, you know, casually getting married in Colombia in April. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not forget you know, that. <laughs> just planning a wedding. Oh Maybe my gosh. It's a lot. Yeah, it is. Ana Maria, where can people find out more if they want to know more about you, about Vols or La Tejana? Where can they go to? So definitely um, email is the best way to reach me personally. So my email is ana-maria at volspeechtherapy.com. And then um, both Gus and I and both of my businesses are very active on Instagram. So the Instagram for Vos is Vos Speech Therapy DC or Ana Maria SLP with no hyphen. And then La Tejana's Instagram is La Tejana DC. Awesome. Thank you so much for coming on today. It was a pleasure. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed the questions and answering them. Thank you. I appreciate it. Take care. You too. Bye. Bye.